Oh, hi. This is my traditional greeting. It's a prairie dog sort of greeting. Yeah, or like one of those dogs that's being held over water and he starts swimming yeah. in the air. That's more like they do this very sort of mechanical. Yeah. It's awesome. Marty studies these things. <laughs> she knows about it. <laughs> do, 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 do. So, yeah, here we are. Oh, hi, yeah. hi Marianne. And hi, Kat. Kat. Yay. Denise. How you guys doing? And Karine from Lily Hummer. Can't Lily. believe you always show up. You're so awesome. Alexa. Everybody's showing up to talk hey, about guys. the things. The things. All the things. They are. Those things are this week. How to feel good when you feel bad. Mm, doesn't make sense. It's a paradox you're thinking. How could that even happen? <laughs> yeah. I That's don't know. crazy, Mother Beck. You've gone too far this time. This Mother time Beck. I've gone too far. <laughs> and I will pay the penalty. Um, yeah. So we've got like a hundred. Oh, we've even got loads. I have no, I have no yeah. place here. So we're talking about uh, how to feel good when you feel bad. And, and you shall go collect. Go and gather questions. And I will come back later. That's just how we do. That's how we do. Hi. So a few mornings ago, actually it was in the middle of the night. It was like three in the morning and I woke up and I didn't feel very good. I know it's shocking. I actually felt I had back pain. Yeah. And I was also quite anxious. I'd woken up from a dream. It wasn't a very good dream. I don't know what was messing around in my head. But I was like, oh, this is weird. And that was when I realized how much my life has changed. Because I remember, I remember going to a wedding once when I was about 20. And I was there with this woman, a girl. We were kind of we were girls, classmates. And her much older sister was there. She had a sister who was like 30 years older than she was. And she said to her sister, how are you? I haven't seen you for months. How are you feeling? And her sister said, well, I don't know what you mean by that. And she said, well, are you happy? And her sister said, who's happy? And I think you guys that this, that right there, when I was like 19 years old, was one of the great moments in my life coaching career. <laughs> Cause I remember thinking if that's what it's like for the next 30 years, if I get to feel like this for the next 30 years, who's happy? Why stay on the bus? Like, let's just call, call it quits and, and like catch you on another planet. And then I remember about 10 years later in therapy, having, and my therapist just, I said, what does happy feel like? And she was like, well, it's like, you know, there are ups and downs, but generally you feel this like, it's like there's a thick mattress of goodness and okayness that's, that's just throughout your life. So you fall, but you can't really hurt yourself. And I was like, what? What madness is this? I'd never heard of such a thing. But I remember thinking, and I remember going home after that therapy session, just lying on my bed going, well, I guess if that's possible, I'm still in it. And the other night when I woke up and I wasn't feeling great, I realized that somewhere in there, the norm of my life changed from not even knowing what that would be like to feeling so consistently good that waking up feeling slightly bad was bizarre. So for all you guys who have never felt deeply happy or like continuously happy over a long period of time, I'm here to tell you that you can start out from a long history of unhappiness and still get really, really happy. And I'm always just, just like, my life is literally a moment to moment wash of gratitude for all the, for the relief, the sheer relief from unhappiness. And I wonder if people who are, have always been happy, who like they say, oh, I, my childhood was such a carefree, happy time. And I'm like, what, what would that even be like? I have no idea. Anyway, I kind of think that on this end, it may be better to not have been happy for decades and then get happy. Because for the longest time, you just sit around going, oh my God, this is so much better. And it's, it's good. It's good once you get there. Getting there is not half the fun. Being there is pretty much all the fun. But 
here's the thing. One of the reasons that I have had lots of consistently happy times, aside from being extremely blessed, is that I learned how to be happy in unhappiness. So I learned how to be happy while I was still unhappy. And then gradually, happiness became the rule and sadness and anger and fear and all that became the exception instead of the other way around. And there's a methodology to this. See, I thought that, well, and people will say, the psychology books will say there are four basic categories of emotion. Well, there are two, aversion and attraction, but even among the, between those two, you've got the attraction is happiness. So glad is one category of feeling, and then mad, sad, and scared are the others. So you can quibble with the minor details, but those are the four categories of emotion. Um, and I used to think, okay, you got to sort of play your card so that somehow one quarter of those, the glad, outweighs mad, sad, and scared, which didn't seem like good odds to me. I think that's wrong. I think there are, there's mad, sad, glad, and scared, but then there is the context in which mad, sad, glad, and scared exist. So I have brought a visual aid. Yes, I'm all prepared. I remember when I was, I don't know, five, and I'd never seen this little optical illusion, and it blew my mind. I don't expect anyone out there has not seen it yet. But you see this, yay. And when you first look at it, you may see like a candlestick or an elaborate goblet, yeah? But then if I tell you, look at the white shapes, not the black shapes, you may see two human faces looking at each other. So this is the faces, vases, optical illusion, very well known. Well, the whole thing about emotion to me now is that all emotion is like the black form in the center of the screen, of the paper. And the white space is something else. It's also an internal experience, but it is the space in which emotion happens. Okay, and they're both real and they're both there. But you go, the brain does something called an object ground reversal. So the, the goblet is the object and the white stuff is the ground. And then you can reverse that and you can make the white stuff the object and the black stuff is the ground, is behind it, the interstitial thing. So here's what happened to me. I began moving into the space where emotions exist instead of emotion. And I've been reading tons of neuroscience for the last several months because of the book I'm writing. And I can assure you that this is a process that you can do deliberately that will change your brain. And I really think our culture does a disservice because it really teaches us. There's these mad, sad, glad, and scared. You go to your psychologist and you know they'll say, well, are you sad? Okay, well, there's a drug you can take for that, which I totally believe in and I think it's wonderful. And then, they, oh, we'll do therapy and we can get you into happy and then you can deal with the, your other feelings. But there's nobody who says to us in a sort of, well, I think a lot of great therapists get there anyway, but culturally there's nothing that says, okay, so you're mad, sad, glad, and scared. What about the field in which they exist? Nobody calls you that. Nobody tells you that that is actually your name. But the very act of going to therapy is you sitting with a psychologist or a therapist of some kind or a life coach and the the person helping you the counselor says let's talk about your moods so as you talk about your moods you are not completely identified as those moods the moment you're not completely identified as the moods and you're talking about the moods you've moved basically into the same position as the counselor so you're now sort of interjecting the counselor who doesn't have your mood, but who watches them. Now there are, we just uh, were recording a little visualization or a little thought exercise that um, will be out many moons from now. So I wanted to right away share it with you guys right here on the gathering room. And it's a way to, sh to create a, an object ground reversal so that even if you're not happy right now, you can begin to develop 
that overall state of softness, preservation, safety that my therapist was talking about all those years ago. So here's how you do it. First of all, find where you're not feeling great. And it could be physical or it could be emotional, but I'd prefer emotional right now. If you have physical pain, find the emotion that is connected to the physical pain. One of the biggest things that was going on for me was I woke up with back pain and it scared me because I thought, oh, now my back's going to hurt for the rest of my life because I had years and years of back pain way back when. And that scared me. Okay. So find the emotion connected with the discomfort or just find sadness, anger, fear, combination of all three, whatever. Usually we try to suppress that negativity. So you show up bright and smiling and you, you act, you, you're the, your perfect self here with all of the rest of us in the gathering room. Well, you're actually not in the gathering room, you're in your room, which is also the gathering room, but that means you can actually let go now and don't hold up a front at all. Instead of um, feeling something sad and going, okay, now I feel it, let yourself actually embody it. So if you're afraid, and act scared, let yourself tense up. If you're angry, get big and angry. If you like, allow the body to experience the emotion and let it be bigger. And then say with your mind, whatever this feeling is, anger, uh, regret, shame, go ahead, be big, be as big as you want to be. There is, be, fill the room, fill the sky, fill the planet, my permission I, to, give, to let you exist is going to get as big as you want to be. You want to be bigger? Okay, I give you permission. Be bigger. Yes, you can be that too. Be bigger. Be bigger, be bigger, be bigger. As you do that, Liz Gilbert, when she does her um, awesome seminars, that's one of the things she does is she has people give themselves permission for various things. And that act of giving permission is really, really powerful in getting us out of the cultural model that won't let us feel our feelings. We, we're all looking for permission to be who we are. So when you become the permission giver and you say, right now, right here, you get to feel what you're feeling, the person giving permission is always bigger than the thing it's giving permission for. And as you embody that authority, you stop being the emotion here, you are not the goblet, and you become the space in which the emotion is happening. I I'm seeing you, I'm looking at you, I allow you, I encourage you, I am telling you things that you're allowed to do, which means I'm actually in the power seat with great compassion, you never get mad at yourself from here. If you do, you're back in anger. Fine. Give yourself permission to do that. Whatever it is you're feeling, give yourself permission to feel bad. And then once you've really got permission and your body's feeling it and everything, then say, I am the one who gives permission. I am the one who allows. I am the one who can watch and can condone and can sympathize. I am huge. The bigger your sorrow, the bigger the part of you that holds the sorrow. So the more sad feelings you have, the greater your spirit becomes. And as you do the figure ground reversal, what happens is the more you watch your feelings and give permission, the more you identify with the permission giver and not with the feelings. And it actually literally does create new structures in the brain. You've heard me talk about Minga Rinpoche, one of my favorite Tibetan lamas who had horrible panic attacks. And it was when he decided to give his panic attacks permission to be huge, and he had a three-day panic attack. And he watched it the whole time. And he didn't say yes or no to it. He just said, I give you permission to exist. I give you permission to exist. And he stopped having panic attacks. And now some call him the happiest man in the world, arguably. So that's my little trick. Just remember when you're sad that the, the little escape hatch is simply the phrase, I give you permission to be sad. I give the sadness my permission. And then 
gradually, gradually, as the sadness responds, you can say, well, it's working, so the permission giver is real, and I'm it. Boom! Figure ground reversal. And what you find is the permission giver is always in peace, is always okay, is stillness, is space itself, and nothing can hurt it. And there you are. You're done. You can feel good even when you feel bad. So that's what I did the other night. I lay there. I gave myself permission to feel bad. And then slowly, slowly, I became the one giving permission and found that peace and rocked myself to sleep again. The end. Okay, so I'm interested in all the questions, and I wanted to give plenty of time for questions today. It's a simple little exercise, but it's really super-duper powerful. Hi, everybody. Hello, Notorious Badger. Hi there. So, I just wanted to put something in, if I may. Yes, please. Um, one of the things is reading through your comments and listening to Martha that I really want to stress in what she's doing is when you connect with the feeling, you let go of the thoughts around the feeling and the, and the, the cause of the feeling. Yeah. So, if you hang on to that through the exercise, it's not going to be as, as powerful as if you just take all the words and focus on the feeling. Very, yes. very good point. And that's why it worked well for me at night because I I was not in a state of mind where I was thinking much. I was very sleepy. And so it was easy to make that switch. And I thought, I, as I lay there, I thought, how weird. I feel really good even though I still feel bad. And then I went to sleep. But I <laughs> didn't start to think about the reasons why until later. Later I realized, oh, I was worried my back would always hurt. Um, and then I was able to sort of deal with it at a thought level. But the original, the original connection is without thought, it's pure observation. If you stick with mind and with language and with logic, you'll get stuck right where our culture is stuck, in hyper analysis of difficult situations that never seems to make them go away. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Does it matter, Marty, if you um, can name the feel? Does it, is it important to be able to name the feeling through in those categories? It helps the mind, which is working with language, have something to grip. Mm -hmm. um, if you don't want to put language on it, though, you can draw it, you can find a symbol for it. One of my favorite things, and maybe you've done this, one of the ways that we can do this, that you may have been doing, because the culture has a little bit of space for it, is when you're sad, you put on sad songs. And when you're angry, you put on angry songs. Come on, a little, you know, a lot of us more set angry little, yeah. you know, ah, jagged little jagged. Ah. I was telling Marty the other day that one of my favorite things when I feel sad is to just like put on Janice Ian is my favorite sad woman music and go like stand by a window and look out at the rain. Oh, that's something quite beautiful. <laughs> if there's no rain, you can put a hose on the window. Yeah. <laughs> but no, it's like it's Elton John. Turn on those sad songs. Yeah. yeah. You know, I mean, there is. Everybody knows that language, uh, music is the language of pure emotion. And when you go to a sad song when you're sad, it paradoxically makes you feel better. That's because you're saying, here is my sadness, be, exist. Mm -hmm. I will listen to you, and not only that, I will listen to you and find you beautiful. Or I will listen to you in angry music and find you inspiring and activating. But not being, you know, if you can find it, you're not but being. But the person, you yeah. don't sit there and go, okay, the sound of that music is angry because mm. you just let it be what it is, right? Yeah. And that's very healing. So what about if you want to name it, but you can't identify it in those categories? Is that important? It's important to hold it very lightly. Mm -hmm. But if you don't know how to articulate something, you may be fascinated enough to just sit and watch it. And a lot of my biggest breakthroughs have, like that's what I was doing with my therapist. I was like, tell me in language what happiness feels like. I want you to describe this phenomenon to me. And she would describe it and I was like, no, never, no, it doesn't work. But I could go looking for it and I'd be like, what, what, what is that? And sometimes language doesn't come for a long time. One of our favorite poets is Stephen Mitchell, um, who did my favorite translation of the Tao Te Ching and these beautiful, my favorite oh, translations of Rilke. Oh, so gorgeous. And he says he just goes to the place where the words are, are willing to come and then waits for them. He doesn't make up any words. And I think he was also a Zen monk and he, would, he meditated um, like twice. He did 100 day meditations where he only slept four hours a day. He meditated 20 hours a day for 100 days. 
I've done that loads of times. <laughs> I mean, good on him. So, yeah, while my nails dry. <laughs> no, I mean, this guy is, he's the real deal. And um, so he can get so still. But he describes um, in a memoir he wrote that hasn't been published yet, he describes how he would have these titanic battles between himself and his, his um, Zen master. They'd, they'd be like animals fighting and clawing at each other for like hundreds of hours. He would sit there and just violence would happy, happen in him or uh, ecstasy would happen in him or, and he just would wait. And then he would put words to it after hundreds of hours of waiting and his words are so perfect, so much of the time. If you go read his poetry, it can give voice to what you're feeling as well. And I think that's what, I, I do think that if you're looking for language to hold something, go to great poetry. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, like when I first read as a kid, so runs my hope, but what am I? An infant crying in the night, an infant crying for the light and with no language but a cry. It's just like, oh, oh, it made me feel so much sadder, but at the same time, it was like someone said it. You know, someone said what I was feeling. And there's the moment you're in sympathy with someone else who's talking about what you're feeling, the moment someone else is pouring out the music of what you're feeling, you are appreciating the beauty of what's happening inside you. And everything can become beautiful there. Even the most terrible experiences can take on this strange, enormous beauty. And I think that's probably why we're, as spiritual beings having human experiences, we're actually here for the beauty that comes from the varieties of experience, even though living through it is often so horrible. Even if it's not, even if you can't comprehend it as beautiful, I think you can get to a point um, where it has a quality of richness about it. You know, meaningful is better. Yes, that's beautiful. What we were talking about that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Cleo is asking. People are really wanting to nail this, so we're going to ask Got questions it. about the exercise. So Cleo says, "So what do you do with the mind?" Um, and and I think what she means is when when you're going in and just okay. Um, so what I would do is I'd I, you you say to the anger or the sadness or the fear be bigger, then you can say to the mind, okay, chatterbox, you chatter. You just go over there and just talk and 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 talk off there. <laughs> but I'm going to be focusing on what I feel. So there are different things. You can, you can let the mind run as long as you don't identify with it. And the problem is that the mind wants to be you, but it's not. It actually isn't you at all. Your mind is not the you that held your first child or saw rain for the first time or cuddled a puppy for the first time. That was not your mind. That was something that informs your mind, but is much bigger, much bigger. And the mind is actually tiny compared to the expanse of the universe, right? But it loves, it's sort of the house of ego, so it loves to be, to try to be you. So the thing that we're told to do in most Asian traditions and the contemplative prayer of mystics in, in our own historical culture is to give it something repetitious to do. If you give the mind something to say, some traditions compare it to giving a monkey a toy to play with that it will just keep banging away with. So focusing on the breath is something where you drop language and let it go. But a mantra, a lot of people say focus on a mantra, get yourself some little prayer beads and, and chant your way through a prayer or do the rosary or just give your, or, or sing a song, sing along with a song that you know well that expresses emotion and fill the language capacity with something that just lets it run. It's like a wood chipper. It just wants things shoved into it all the time. But language itself doesn't create anything that is truly worth having unless it's coming from a deeper place than the mind. We've been, I love these um, things that Roe found online. They taught computers that have artificial intelligence. They fed them all these novels. And then they said, write a novel. And the artificial intelligence with all this verbal capacity and all this information 
started writing novels <laughs> and the things that it writes are so funny like one of them started they were just the first lines <clears throat> of these novels and then one goes he there was a boy there once was a boy with blue eyes with sandy hair and blue eyes that looked at all times as though he had been shoved through a million compartments <laughs> and another one said he had a strange name, and he was a very big boy indeed. <laughs> it's, the first, it's the first line of a novel that the AI is and going to so it's Just to language. <laughs> language, the language capacity by itself is just, it's like a motor that just runs and runs and runs. To create a receptacle for emotion with it, you have to sit with the emotion first, and you have to respect your experience, your felt heard sounded experience first and you know the, the lang in language we come to consensus and in healing we come to our senses so the consensus of language needs to go out the window for a while while you just watch and then use language only to name what you're experiencing mm. and God, this happened to me a few weeks ago i was meditating and then something just opened <laughs> and I was sitting, I, I did this and then I just sat in that exact position for over an hour because I didn't want it to go away. And I just, after about five minutes, a word came up and the only word for it was empty. It was just, it was so empty. And it was the most astonishing thing. I was just like, it was literally as if the Grand Canyon just opened up around me and I was like, oh my God, it's completely empty. Now that was language I'd read before. I just never experienced it. I had no yeah. idea. But and I was groping for a word and that was it. But it was like compared to the actual experience, it was not enough. Yeah. Not enough. Not enough. Language is never enough. But it helps. So I agree. I agree. Um, do you have any last questions? Yeah, Anne Marie says, uh, can you do this with a thought or a story too, or just a feeling? Yeah, you can give your stories, or you can give them permission to exist. The problem is that they'll run away with your mind then. So the, mind, the language has to be disciplined. You have to be a little bit disciplined. You give all the permission in the world to your emotion. And you put some boundaries around your storytelling. Usually we give absolute permission to our storytelling and put boundaries on our emotions. No, no, no. Without acting out too much, give yourself no boundary in feeling. But put some rules around the language part of your mind. Thank you. Thank you very much. Like, Marty, thank you very much. I know you're a very very ardent storyteller <laughs> and you can go write those down somewhere and perhaps someone will pay you for it but we know that it really is very very idiotic and useless and um what's real is what we're sensing right now and then no boundaries at all on experience that's my story and i'm sticking to it i love your story we still have a couple minutes um yeah i know i i I'm trying not to open any new. Mm. Dee Dee is saying she gives her mind all kinds of toys yes. and it works. I love that. All right. How about this from Carol? She says, I've listened to some meditations that guide me to be an observer of my emotions and I've found temporary relief and freedom. Is this a similar concept and how do I make that feeling? Last? Yeah, it absolutely is a repetitive experience of connecting neural synapses that trigger these feelings of being of watching of being bigger than the emotion um and what you've got to remember is in neurology what wires together what fires together wires together so you fire something and it becomes an experience if you fire it again and again and again and again that neural path gets very strong and it gets wrapped with this substance called myelin and and the thought comes more easily to you and it feels more convincing. So a million times, you've probably told yourself, oh, I'm sad and I don't want to be sad. So that's a very, very massively myelinated circuit. But you've probably very rarely told yourself, I'm sad and I want it to be bigger. Go ahead, be bigger. 
the more you do that and the more you come to that state of oh it doesn't you're still sad that's the weird thing about it you're still sad like both figures are still here there's the sadness and there's the space around the sadness and we're very connected to the emotion and we think that's real and that is what looks like truth but this is just as true and the more times you give yourself permission to feel the more you switch into seeing the white space as the truth and the goblet in the middle as something formed inside it and that what happens is when the figure ground reversal gets wired more heavily than your original condition so the feeling of giving permission is stronger than the feeling of being sad instead of vice versa mm -hmm. when you get that this gets stronger and stronger and this gets weaker and weaker so as you give it permission to be bigger the sadness actually completely disappears and so you can have hours days weeks months of feeling pretty damn good and um that is not something i would have said for the first several decades of my life now I'm a thousand years old. It's true. <laughs> I, I just wanted to add that don't don't give up on it if it if it takes quite a bit of time because you're unmyelinating something that's that's been yeah. been there forever. So not just repetitive, but also like give it a, a bunch of time and and false steps, but you you'll find it. Let me show you. I know we're over time, but try this. Fold your arms. Okay. Now fold them the other way with the the opposite hand on top. That, right? it's not so easy right no. that's what it's like this is what you're used to doing mm -hmm. I am sad that's bad and then to say I am sad and that's okay give it more permission is like doing it the other way <laughs> you could just do it the same way <laughs> exactly exactly that happens all the time <laughs> and that just shows you that's a heavily myelinated circuit and changing it is like <laughs> you're like no years old again so don't feel bad if it feels awkward and it's like oh that doesn't feel real it won't feel real at first but it'll give you relief and the more times you do it to get the relief the more permanent the re relief becomes and that's what we all want for all of us that's what we all want in the for gathering all of us and Mwah! a big thanks to everyone because this week was the biggest gathering room what? so thanks to everybody who came love along. you love you in any state what feel what you're feeling feel the feeling we'll see you next time